asked a lot of questions in Sunday school this morning. You know, we, people get caught up on the craziest things sometimes. And, uh, you know, we're talking about creation and all that good stuff. And, uh, talked about, uh, where, where's Garden B? Anybody care to tell us where the Garden of Eden is? The fact is, you can't. You can't. That's just one of those things. God said, look, I created it. It's still somewhere. God knows where it is, but we don't. And there's a reason for that. God, it's, it's look, I think one day I'm going to see something more beautiful than that. So why worry about it? So, but I want to ask you all some questions this morning. One of them I know you can't answer. I hope one or two of you will. So here's the first one. Now, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm talking to mainly Christians here when I ask this question. Is Jesus coming back? Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming back. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back. It says that we need to be ready for Jesus to come back. <clears throat> When's he coming back? That's one of those questions we don't know the answer to. The Bible tells us that not only do we not know, that not even the angels know, and the Son doesn't know, only God the Father knows that time. You know, Jesus is just like us. He's sitting there in heaven going, just let me know when, Father. Just let me know when. I can spill water up here already. Make it mess. I can't stand it. I've got to clean it up. <clears throat> Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come back, okay? But here's the question that I want each of you to answer for yourself this morning. Ask yourself this question. Am I really living ready for Christ to return? See, that's the thing. Well, you know, we get so caught up about when Jesus... There have been people that have predicted when Christ was going to come back for I don't know how many... There's one guy, I can't even remember his name, but I mean, every time he'd miss a deadline, you know, I remember the first time he said, Jesus come back on this day at this time. Nothing happened. So what did he do? Well, I was off a little bit. I misfigured something. He's going to come back on this day at this time. That guy kept on and kept on, and finally I think he died. And I'm kind of, you know, I hate to say it this way, but I'm kind of glad he did because I got tired of listening to it. And folks, listen. If you read Scripture and you know anything about the return of Christ, you know that nobody can predict when Christ is coming back. And I think God wanted it that way, but here's what He tells us in His Word over and over again. Just be ready. Because it's going to happen. Be ready. But how are we living our lives in the meantime? See, that's the thing that I want to talk about today. That's what I think we overlook sometimes. I read an interview some time back. Y'all know who John Grisham is. Most everybody knows who John Grisham is. I mean, he's the author that wrote all these books. And, you know, I always thought, ever, ever, and they made movies about a bunch of the books he's written, like, you know, The Firm. Uh, that was a book he wrote. And it was about a law firm, okay? And then he wrote one called The Client. And it was about a client that this lawyer had. And, and then he wrote one called the Pelican Brief, where they had to give a brief to a judge. It had to do with lawyers. You know what I found out? <laughs> He's a lawyer. <laughs> I didn't know that. He's a lawyer. He went to law school. But there are some other things I didn't know about him, <laughs> and I was very impressed when I read this interview. You know, they were talking to him, and, and uh, he said that nowadays he focuses on things that have lasting meaning. That's a good thing to do. Focus on things that have lasting meaning. And he said, when I talk about things with lasting meaning, I'm talking about my faith in God. See, I didn't know the man was Christian. But he is. And then he went on to tell a story of a friend of his. He went to Mississippi State University to do his undergraduate work. And he, he uh, had a friend there at school, and they had graduated from Mississippi State. About a year later, this friend contacted him and said, hey, let's get together. So they set up a time so they could have lunch. And he said, so I met my friend for lunch, and, uh, and he said, I was never more shocked when after a few minutes, he said, John, the reason I wanted to meet with you is I need to let you know something. 
I have terminal cancer. I'm dying. And the man was 25 years old. And John Grisham sat there stunned. And after a while, he looked at his friend and he says, what do you do when you realize you're about to die? Good question. Let me remind you of something. We're all going to die. Don't know when. But what do you do when you realize you're about to die? That was the question John Grisham asked his friend. And his friend, without hesitation, said it's real simple. You get things right with God. You spend as much time with those you love as you can. And then you settle up with everybody else. But then he said this, you know, really, you ought to live every day like you only have a few more days to live. What profound advice. Are we living like Jesus is coming back? See, I got thinking about that thing. Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, I thought I remembered this. This is real good too. Martin Luther, he could, he could come up with some things off of his head now. And there was a group of people talking to him about Christ's return and when Christ was going to come back in the second coming. And finally, and they were kind of prodding him for a comment on it. You know what Martin Luther said? He said, there are two days on my calendar, this day and that day. Let that sink in. Folks, we ought to be living this day like it's that day. That's what Martin Luther was saying. Folks, how are we living our lives? Nobody knows when Christ is going to return. Although there's a lot of people that try to predict it. But see, here's, here's the thing. I think the greatest danger that the church faces is not trying to predict when Jesus is coming back. But acting like he's not coming at all. See, that's the problem. I think we got far too many Christians, far too many churches. Oh, yeah, that's an abstract concept. Uh, 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 that's an abstract thing out there somewhere that somebody said one time about Jesus coming back, but nobody lives like it's really him. Folks, that's dangerous. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Stand with me. This is very familiar scripture that I'll use. Jesus is telling a parable of the ten virgins. And he says this, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And then all those virgins who arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your, of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, Say, Not so, lest there, not, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. And afterward came all the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And then verse 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to hear with spiritual ears what you are trying to say to us, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. You know what? I think the most important thing for us to consider is how we should be living in light of Christ's return. How should we be living if we know and we really believe that Christ is going to come back? How should we be living? And I think there's three things that we need to be looking at today as far as how we ought to live. Number one, we ought to live with expectant hope. 
Now live with expectant hope. Now I want to try to explain what I mean by that. And I'm going to turn over here and read a couple other passages of Scripture uh, throughout. But listen to what Titus chapter 2. Uh, let me find it right quick. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says this. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly or seriously, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. I want you to... What did he say? Looking for that blessed hope. See, I think a lot of times we read that and we think, oh, praise the Lord, we got the blessed hope. When we understand this in context, it ought to make us feel real guilty. Listen, looking, uh, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Listen to me, folks. Paul was writing to Titus here, and he said that Christ's return for them, for the church in that day, was a blessed hope. Have you ever stopped to think about why he put that that way? If you study church history from the very beginning of the church until the day that Paul was writing this, and even after that, and even continuing today in some parts of the world, what does that really mean? That blessed hope. Folks, let me tell you something. Throughout church history, most of the time, the church has had a yearning for deliverance. Jimmy, a yearning for, for deliverance. Deliverance from what? Folks, listen. If you look at church history and what the church has had to go through in the past, they were looking for deliverance from war. They were looking for deliverance from pain. Deliverance from suffering. Deliverance from death. They were looking for deliverance from the poverty and persecution that went with being a Christian. Folks, let me tell you something. Christians throughout history, especially those who are part of God's church, have been persecuted. And in the day that Paul wrote this, he was writing it because there was a true yearning desire for deliverance within the church desire to be delivered to something better. And that's why he called it a blessed hope. But you know what? Today we kind of live comfortable on it. I mean, stop and think about it. Right now we still have the freedom to come here and meet in this building and worship God. I'm thankful for that. But you know what? I never thought I would say this, but I don't know that I, I, I won't still be here when we see that come to me because of the way things are going in our culture, in our society, in our world. Let me tell you something. I think Satan knows Jesus is coming pretty soon. And he's doubling his efforts. Listen to me. We live in comfort. Comfort. We have religious freedom. You know what? We've got modern medicine. And thank God for it. Because our little illnesses and ailments, we can go to the doctors, those that have the knowledge, and they can fix us right up. We have a good lifestyle. We're living comfortably. You want me to give you my interpretation of living comfortably? We got something. We got something. I was telling somebody this morning, I've kind of made my mind up and come here, I'm going to do some things different for me personally. You know, I was working at the police department, I was working out all the time, I was running, I was in good shape. You know, I was up there singing that song this morning, give a slap out of breath. I just never used to do that. I think I'm going to get back to it. I think I'm going to work on some things this year. You know why? Because I got something. I mean, you know, we, we got it so comfortable. And you know what? When people say, yeah, we as Christians, we let, let's let's talk about the church this morning. I don't know if y'all know this, but when I got up this morning and stepped out on the back porch, a little bit chilly. Oh, a <laughs> little bit chilly. I stepped out there without a jacket on, and I thought, man, whoo, I'm going back inside. So I went back inside. 
But you know what? I'm getting ready to take this coat off in this building because it's plumb hot in here to me, okay? We, it's cold outside, but you know what? We're comfortable in here. We, you know, we got this nice building to come to that shelters us from the elements. Hey, we even got padded pews to sit on. Make it a little more bearable to sit there and listen to that nut up there as he rambles along. I remember the time when I was young, you come in there and them benches was about twice as long as these right here, and they wasn't nothing but solid oak about that thick, and they wasn't a pad nowhere. I remember most of the old folks coming in, and I was a youngin, so them people probably wasn't that old, but they, they would walk in and every one of them would have a cushion with them to sit down on the pew. They don't have to do that no more. We got padded pews. We done got soft. We done got comfortable. Now see, here's the problem. <laughs> There's no urgency to spread the gospel anymore because we have gotten so comfortable that we're really not looking for anything. And folks, if you really want to get serious about living the way we ought to in the light of Christ's return, we got to remember that there's something better out there, and that's heaven. And we need to be telling people about it. But it's hard to get people to listen nowadays because they got it so good. I remember my mama and Papa Harvey. Bless his heart. Papa says, I, I wish I could go back to the old days. Mama would say, Not me. <laughs> He said, I like having to wash the sheep. And you think about how many clothes she washed. I mean, she was one of the oldest of 17 in her house with her mom and daddy. And her job growing up was taking care of about five or six of her brothers and sisters. And then she finally got old enough to get married. Well, Papa's mom and daddy had died, so she had to raise his five siblings. And then when she got done with them, she had her own. She washed a lot of clothes in her life and cooked a lot of meat. So folks, I'm not saying we need to go back to the way it used to be. We need to carefully to get back to it. I'm not saying we got to go back to the way it used to be. But we sure need to live like We need to look for something more. We've become comfortable and we've become complacent. And so there's no urgency to tell anybody about Jesus Christ. Folks, let me tell you something. We need to live with that hope that the early church lived with. They had hope that something was going to be better and it was coming. And they called it a blessed hope because it brought comfort to their hearts. First of all, we need to live with expected hope. We need to live while we're here, a sanctified life. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. But folks, basically what it means to be sanctified is to be set apart. Set apart from what? Set apart from the world. we got to be different when the world looks at us. That means we got to live with self-control. You know what? I look out there and I see folks that just ain't got any self-control at all. None. They just gonna do whatever. They'll go whichever way the wind blows. And they don't think about consequences. And folks, we gotta be different than that. We gotta be different from the world. We have to live a sanctified life. We've got to stand out in a world that's lost. We need to stand out. You know what Matthew 5 talks about? It says a light that is set on a hill can be seen. I remember our little ones up here singing. It's the way I'm going to let it. Folks, that's the way we ought to be living. That's the way we ought to be living. You know, and I always like it because they do the hand motions and everything and they get really excited when they get to the no part. Hide it under a bushel. No! We need some adults to get that excited about not covering up their life. Okay. Listen, we... 
We are the light of the world, the Bible says. And we sit there and try to cover up the light. That ain't what God says. We got to stand out. We got to shine. We got to look different than the rest of the world. Don't try to hide the light. Because that light is what is the hope of the world. It's Jesus Christ. I read, I don't know who said it, but one person said, we got to live here, but we don't have to believe in being. You know what? That, that's the, almost the perfect de definition of living a sanctified life. you got to live here. we got to be in the world, but we ain't got to believe in being. And there's way too many Christians or people that call themselves Christians nowadays that want to blend in. We got way too many churches in our in our country today that they want to look just like the world. They're blending in with the world. Now I can't remember what the name of that church is out in Texas. That thing is absolutely huge. They got a young black man that's a pastor. And they put on an Easter show. Y'all may have seen some of this on YouTube, but let me tell you something. That was the most satanic thing I've ever seen in my life. And he's talking about, oh my God, that was so powerful. That was it. Yeah, you better start looking at the power that you're looking to. Folks, they blending in with the world. They acting just like the world. And I was sitting over a while ago during the singing. John said, you know, that's one thing I love about this church, man. They sing them old gospel songs and they sing hymns and stuff like that. Songs that have meaning. And I said, I know it. I love it. There's too many people uh, in churches now. There's too many quote-unquote preachers that want to blend in. So they don't, they don't sing songs that have meaning. In fact, now let me go ahead and throw my plug in. This is where we break for just a second so I can advertise for tonight. Do you, do you know what the title of my message is tonight? Idle songs. All right, now back to our... You need to be here tonight. We must live a sanctified life, one that's set apart. And then lastly, we must live our witness. What do we mean? What should your witness as a Christian include? What, what should it include scripturally? Well, if you look at scripture, and I'm going to give you the, the short version, okay? If you look at Scripture, number one, it should be providing for those in need. The Bible says if somebody comes to you and they have a need, you need to do everything you can to meet them. If somebody comes to you and they're hungry, you say, hey, be filled. God bless you. And you walk off. You're going to walk off. They're still going to be hungry. You haven't done a thing. But if they say, hey, I'm hungry, and you feed them, then they'll listen to what you say about Jesus Christ. Our witness should be providing for those in need. According to Scripture, it should be taking care of the widows and orphans. It means laying up treasure in heaven. You know what folks say? What do you mean by that? I've had people ask me that. What do you mean? You know, you said, I heard you, I heard you say that the Bible says that we all lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. That's exactly right. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you have a job. And so as part of your job, you get a paycheck. And I don't know if anybody does this anymore, but so, you know, used to you would actually get a check that you took to the bank and, and put in the bank. Nowadays, most of it's all direct positive. Same thing, you're still getting a check, right? And I said, you will take that check to the bank and you will put it in the bank. And you try to save as much of that check as you can so you can build you up a little nest egg over here. And they go, yeah, yeah. I said, you're laying up treasures on earth with that nest egg. And they say, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing necessarily. I think all of us ought to be wise with the money that God gives us. But I said, instead of putting things in an earthly bank, you need to worry about putting things in a heavenly bank. And they said, how do I do that? I said, number one, make sure your soul's right with God. Number one, make sure you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I said, when you do that, then the Holy Spirit's going to come in there and he's going to start telling you what treasures in heaven are. But I'll give you my definition of what treasures in heaven are. When you start living, waiting on God to come back and doing what Christ said we ought to do while we're here, then you're laying up treasures in heaven. You provide for one person in need. You know what? That person may turn to Christ because of that. That's treasure in heaven right there. Let me tell you something. You go out and you tell people about Jesus. Somebody's going to listen. You may not ever know it, 
But somebody's going to come to Christ because of that. That's laying up treasure in heaven. You know what? Anything that we do for Jesus Christ in His name on this earth, that's laying up treasure in heaven. The Bible says in Revelation, and I've started doing a study on Revelation, but it says over there that when we get to heaven, that God will give us our rewards for how we have lived here on this earth. And I've told you this before, and I'll keep it short. I don't want to get to that day where I am kneeling before God and He gives me my reward, and there's not. Folks, let me tell you something. After what He's done for me, I want to do as much as I can for Him. Now, here's the thing. Is it down? I do it because I want those rewards from God? No. Because what does the Bible say? When we get there, he's going to give us all this stuff, but after it's tried to fire, we're going to take it when it's purified and give it back to him because he's the only one that's worthy to receive. But folks, I just, I don't want to get to heaven and have the king of kings that died on the cross for my sin and shed his blood for my sin. I don't want to have anything. I don't want to go in front of him with empty hands. I want to have something to give him in return. Folks, that's treasure in heaven. We ought to be living our witness. We ought to be demonstrating the love of Christ. I read something not long ago, and I was impressed, and i got to tell you. There was a time when I didn't like this young man named C.J. Stratton. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about. The reason I didn't like C.J. Stroud is because he played for the wrong team. Played for Ohio State. Now, <coughs> he got humbled when they played Georgia. Twice. And I thought, hey, if I saw, you know, because that's all we talk about, Michigan and Ohio State. Nobody else exists. You know how, you know the only way Michigan can win a national championship like they did this year? If you tell Georgia they can't play. Because they let Georgia play. Georgia would be the champs again. But they say, oh, okay. So we're going to tell them they can't play. So we'll give them. But let me tell you something about C.J. Stroud. Good football player. Got drafted. He graduated last year. This past year he played for the Houston Texans. Okay? He took them in his rookie year in the pros from probably the worst team in the NFL and made the playoffs in his rookie season. Let me tell you something. That man can play football. I got to give him credit. But here's what I did not know about him. I read an interview with C.J. Stroud as a professional football player. Okay? This is what he said. My foundation as a man is that I'm a man of God. I didn't know he was Christian either. And he has always given Christ and God the Father credit for any success he's had. He said this. Well, let me back up. He said, Jesus laid his life on the cross for us. I really believe that. This is bigger than football. Football is my platform. Spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ is my purpose. Did you hear that? He said, my purpose is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. My platform to do it is football. He said, I think that's what God wants. And so my question is this, how are we living if we really believe Jesus is going to come back? How are we living? Are we using our jobs as our platform to spread the gospel about Jesus Christ? Are we using our hobbies or what we enjoy to do? Are we using everything in our life to be a platform to tell people about Jesus Christ? Can people look at us and tell that we're different? Folks, listen. We ought to be living with expected hope. We ought, we ought to be living a sanctified life. 
but we ought to be living our lives as a witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is real, Jesus Christ will save you, and Jesus Christ is coming back. I don't know when. And I'm not even going to attempt to try to tell you when. All I can tell you that I know in my heart is he's coming. And we ought to be living like he's coming back. Father, I ask that you would today just speak to the hearts of people who are here. Father, I pray that if there is anybody here that has never accepted you, that today would be the day that they do that. Father, I pray that they would know you, not just know about you. And Heavenly Father, that's our prayer. But Father, I also pray for Christians. Lord, I ask that you would just convict the hearts of those who have been living without that blessed hope with no urgency. And Father, I pray that you would would work in our lives and in the life of our church. Father, I pray that we might live with that blessed hope, that we might live with the idea and the knowledge that there is something better than what we have right now, and it's heaven. It's eternity. And Lord, may that spur us to tell others and be more faithful in witnessing through our lives what we do and what we say. Father, today I pray that you would just take this time and use it as you will for us in your name we pray. Amen.